$400 a month for water, the mistake costing a Laverne man repeatedly and his struggle to get a cash refund. It takes a village. We can do better. The little things we can all do to cut down on juvenile crime. Getting the party started down on the farm. I love this place. This place is the perfect getaway. To Why Bonnaroo is about more than just music for so many fans. Fox 17 News at 9 starts now. Middle Tennessee's only prime time news. This is Fox 17 News at 9, your code red station. My water bill is supposed to be $40, not $450. New tonight, one family fighting to get their money back after claiming to have paid four times their actual usage on their water bill, which adds up to thousands of dollars over the last two and a half years. Now, this all played out in Laverne. Uh, the city admits a meter reader error in the system is to blame, but neither side is right now able to resolve the dispute. Fox 17 News Caitlin Miller now with more after speaking with both the city of Laverne and the family. Most people pay less than $100 for their water bill, but we spoke with the Starnes family who say that they're paying about $400 per month for their water bill. They say that they took this up with the city, but are unhappy with the proposed resolution. 91,900 and three gallons is what we've used so far. Robert Starnes showing us his water meter, pointing out how many gallons of water his family has used since they moved into this home two and a half years ago. It doesn't match up with the city's records, showing where Starnes has been billed for using hundreds of thousands of gallons of water in that same time frame. This is my bill for March, and as you can see, the consumption of water, they have me at 37,600 gallons of water usage this month. Starnes has notified the city, complaining about the costly bills for months, but he says it never goes anywhere. Fox 17 News reached out to the city of Laverne. It did admit that there was a system error on the Starnes account. The city spokesperson says it tried to make things right by offering the family a $4,000 credit. But Starnes wants the city to cut him a check for all the extra money he's paid. By me paying three to four hundred dollars a month for the last two and a half years, a credit isn't good enough for me. The city isn't budging there, stating reimbursement checks are only used if a resident is moving and claims the family used a voucher assistant program to pay the bill and would only be eligible for half the overpayment refund. Again, the meter shows that they use just over 91,000 gallons of water. Now, the city did admit that it was a system error, and now they have to come to an agreement as to how they'll get reimbursed. Reporting from Laverne, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. An update tonight on the leak of the Covenant shooter's writings. The Tennessee Star now asking the court to cancel a hearing surrounding the organization's publishing of leaked writings from the shooter. Chancellor Ashley Miles is asking the publication to show why the Tennessee Star should not be held in contempt. The attorney for the Star claims the court order violates the state's shield law doesn't follow the contempt law, deprives the publication of due process, along with other constitutional issues. The motion states the Tennessee Star will appeal the order for the hearing. This, as the battle to get those writings made public, carries on. Continuing coverage now on the fentanyl death of 23-month-old Ariel Rose. 18 months after her death, two people now face charges in connection with her death, but there is also a civil lawsuit. Fox 17 News' Amanda Chen now with an update on that lawsuit. We know that Ariel Rose's grandfather wants to hold the nonprofit running the facility accountable, but evidence submitted into the file reveals new details about other entities potentially involved at the location where Ariel died. Attorneys for Mickey Rose, Ariel's grandfather, are now potentially pointing fingers at Kingdom Group in this lawsuit. Kingdom Group is a company focused on breaking cycles of poverty and assisting faith-based institutions. Back in February of 2023, the group confirmed to me they owned the building where Ariel died, although in their most recent filing, they claim they do not. Emails submitted by Mickey's attorneys show a woman emailing Kingdom Group back in March of 2022, asking about the death of her brother. Her email states in part, I don't believe that enough was done to prevent his death. 
and I believe this is just the beginning of problems for this facility. Keep in mind, my investigation last August revealed that drug-related death and another death at this housing facility months before Ariel died. I have reached out to Kingdom Group and am waiting to hear back. However, in the company's statement to me last February, they seemed to put responsibility on Community Care Fellowship, the nonprofit who ran that housing facility and had no involvement in the nonprofit's management of that location. Reporting in the studio, I'm Amanda Chin, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Violence and family dynamics a lot of times get passed down from one generation to another generation. In Operation Crime and Justice, not a quick fix. That's what community members are saying about recent youth crime. Teen crime is in the spotlight tonight after two teenagers died in two different shootings all in a matter of weeks. Fox 17 News' Kylie Walker joining us from Metro Nashville Police Precinct in North Nashville with more. Police behind me have their hands full and city leaders say oftentimes this troubling pattern starts in their youth and if left unchecked, it can shape the course of their future. Two lives taken too soon. First in Bellevue, where a 13 year old died in a shooting at a popular park. Weeks later in Madison, a 16 year old also shot and killed at a park. Police say both killed by other kids. They have so much potential and obviously when death occurs, there isn't a chance to explore that and there's not um, there's not that chance to go on to be what they were created to be. Valerie Craig with Tennessee Voices for Victims says we're all creatures of habit and tend to repeat what we know. Craig has worked with incarcerated youth where she noticed similar patterns. The common part is always trauma. It's always their childhood experiences. It's domestic violence. It's child abuse. It's abandonment. It's drug addiction or alcoholism that's running in the family. Craig says we have to be more intentional about treating childhood trauma. You've got to love them. We also caught up with Pastor Howard Jones of Fairfield Church, who is also a principal with Metro Schools. We can do better uh, as a community as a country, we can do better. Families can do better. He touched on the importance of having a positive role model. Fathers are going to have to connect up really aggressively to connect with our kids that are killing and shooting each other. He was also a probation officer in juvenile court. In his 10 years on the job, Howard says he also saw a link between the lack of proper education and acceleration of crime in the city. We've got to educate them so that they can have a hope and a connection to this city called Nashville. Howard says these issues will take a collective effort to address. The mayor's office also gave me a list of organizations that are available citywide, which I put on our website, fox17.com. This, of course, is an important issue that I'll continue to stay on. For now, reporting in North Nashville, Kylie Walker, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. All right, plenty of sunshine today as the warm-up begins. The warm-up begins. Today was the first day of it, and now we're going to be in the 90s from here on out for the next several days. So I guess just buckle oh up. I don't know. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to the upper 90s, I think, one, day, one of these days, too. I'll show you that day here in just a little bit. Live look over Broadway, just a little bit of a crowd out there. Temperatures tonight, not going to be terrible, but earlier this afternoon, we had 94. That was our high temperature here in Nashville. We're still in the lower 80s right now, too. 83, our current temperature, the current time, 9 to 10, clear skies, and we're going to stay mostly clear as we go through the rest of tonight, too. All dry right here on the radar. No rain really anywhere too close to us in Kentucky or here in Tennessee. We do have this cold front that has been bringing a severe weather threat to areas northwest of here, like Illinois and Indiana. That's going to start to or keep on dropping our dropping down our way and that is going to try to bring in some of those rain showers for us for tomorrow but I think that's just really going to run out of steam and fizzle on out before it can actually make its way down to us so the rain chance for tomorrow looking very very slim I think most of us are going to be staying on the dry side of things tomorrow temperatures right now lower 70s for uh, lotus lower 70s to upper 70s for most locations 76 cookville crossville at 72 73 in McMinnville we have some upper 70s out further west 79 linden columbia also down there in Lewis. Lewisburg. Air quality alert remains in place for tomorrow. That's going to be for all these counties highlighted in orange. Gallatin, Nashville, Murfreesboro, Columbia, Dixon, all included in that air quality alert again. So if you have any sort of respiratory issues, just uh, kind of limit your time outdoors tomorrow if you can. Allergy levels, though, on another note, were not bad at all. Tree was low, grass was low, so good news right there, too. Well, the heat is here like we've been talking about. The 90s are here to stay for the next several days. Sunday is going to be the hottest day of them all, and we'll also look at if we have any rain chances to help 
out with any of this heat. All those details come in it for you here in just a bit. More than just the music, what Bonnaroo fans say keeps them coming back years. Nearly 22 million children living in America rely on schools for their meals. Fox 17 News and our parent company, Sinclair Broadcasting, are partnering with Feed America for the Sinclair Care Summer Hunger Relief Program. You can donate by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to SinclairCares.com. In entertainment news tonight, the Bonnaroo Music Festival is well underway at the farm near Manchester. Tens of thousands of people here from across the country to attend. And everyone we met and spoke with today talked about the special feeling that the Bonnaroo Festival gives them. Since it started in 2002, Bonnaroo has been synonymous with fun. Fans started pouring through the gates before noon. And stages like this will soon be filled with big name music acts. Super excited to see Post Malone. Um, super excited to see Diplo. That's going to be one of the biggest parties here. We're here for uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, most of all. But other than that, we're here to party. And party they will, four straight days. But Bonnaroo fans say this is a very different kind of party. One that brings people from all walks of life together to escape. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, people walking around in glitter, costumes, just to, just to get away from themselves. So this allows you, there's no judgment here, so you see some of the most craziest costumes, and I think that's the best part of it. This is Jamel Dark's 10th Bonnaroo. He brought 16 friends with him from Buffalo, New York. Carly Lee Cooper is a first-timer from just outside Philadelphia, but she's already feeling it. I think it's the vibes everybody brings. It seems like a lot of people come here year after year, and it really shows because of how much community they give to the newcomers. Carly Ketchum is another return customer who brought a friend this year. They paid extra for the VIP experience. Let me just say air conditioning, okay? Um, the bathrooms are air conditioned. They're not porta potties, which is great. Yeah. We've got different viewing areas. Um, there are even certain sections where you have a different menu than the other people who are out in um, like just the farm itself. Ketchum says some of the happiest moments of her life have been here at Bonnaroo and she's looking to add to the memories. Now, the heat will certainly be part of the memories this year. Festival organizers have hydration stations. I'll get it out. Also, medical help on site for those who need it. By the way, Bonnaroo, again, starting today, runs all the way through Sunday night. Well, as the heat turns up this summer, many families will head to the pool for a fun way to cool down, of course. And whether you're swimming in your own pool or using a neighborhood pool, it's important for youngsters to know how to swim. That's because the water can be dangerous for kids. Drowning is the leading cause of death for children up to age 14. The CDC encourages parents to get their kids swim lessons from a reputable source. We focus on uh, helping the kids be as comfortable and as safe as possible in the water. Uh, our whole program is distance based, so it's really uh, uh, comfortable and helpful for parents to understand what the kids are capable of. And we do that through our world class facility, professional instructors, and my favorite piece is our mobile technology. For more information on preventing drowning, we have linked information from the CDC. It's on our website right now. Just hop over to fox17.com and look under Fox Links. Well, speaking of the heat this week, we want to know how you're holding up. How hot is too hot? We've had almost 300 people weigh in and a little more than half. 51.7% of respondents say anything over 90 degrees, that's too hot. 20.5% uh, said up to 80 degrees. Almost 20% also said there's no such thing <laughs> basking in it. 7.9% uh, say anything above 70, so a little less tolerable there. This poll is live right now. To cast your vote, you can scan the QR code right there on your screen. It will take you to our X page where you can vote and weigh in. We'll show you those updated poll results a little later tonight. All right, weather-wise, we're talking about the heat, and uh, Brett alluded uh, a moment ago the fact that you know, it's going to get a lot worse than what we're looking at right now. It is, you know, and I'm kind of part of that last group. I like it. The hotter, the, the more humid, the hotter, the better, like 115-degree heat index. I love those days. Yeah. I don't know about y'all, but if I'm If it's dry. Crazy. Where do you fall? You like the heat I mean, so I'm much? from Florida, so. So you're on board with me. I mean, when I get into the hot car, I'm like, oh, it's so nice. Okay. Before I turn on the. <laughs> Where are you at, Scott? <laughs> Anything over 80 is a little warm oh, for me. Yeah. Over 80? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A little less tolerable yeah. over here, huh? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, well, so it's going to be happy in the summer. <laughs> 
Scott, you got a warm week ahead for you then. We're going to be pushing into the 90s for the next several days. We hit 94 today. That was our high right here in Nashville, and we're about to go up to the upper 90s by the time we hit a Sunday. Right now in Nashville, we're at 83, still mostly clear, and that's exactly how we're going to stay for the rest of the night, too. We're going to be watching this little system, this cold front that's up here. It's brought a severe weather threat earlier today to parts of Iowa, down in the Missouri, Illinois, Indiana. That cold front is going to keep on sliding our way, but I think a lot of that is just going to fizzle out before it reaches down here. So all dry right now. We're going to stay dry through the rest of the night too. Temperatures right now low to upper 70s. 72 Crossville, 76 in Cookville. We're at 77 in Dixon, 80 as the current temperature up there in Clarksville. So here's that cold front that I was just showing you on the radar map. It's going to keep on dropping down to the south through the overnight hours. This is Friday morning, 7 o'clock, but you'll notice that that rain just kind of starts to disappear from our map right here. Just uh, not looking at much of a rain chance as we head throughout the day on Friday. If we get anything, just a very stray isolated shower probably at best, but I think most areas Areas will stay dry throughout the day on a Friday. So that's uh, this is Saturday, seven o'clock in the morning. We'll be off to a dry start. We're going to stay dry through the rest of Saturday too. Not expecting any rain chance. And then by the time we hit Sunday, we start out Sunday dry. A little bit later on in the day, late in the afternoon, it can't entirely rule out an isolated shower. I think overall, though, the best rain chance looks to come into play on Monday. Though this is Monday, 5 p.m. We're going to start to see a little bit better moisture move in. So about a 20 to 30 percent chance for some isolated to scattered showers and a thunderstorms for us on Monday and in Tuesday right now. I think it's looking pretty dry again too. Humidity values aren't as terrible as they could be for this time of year, but they are going to bump up a little bit. I think we're decent through Sunday, but they start to bump up Monday, Tuesday and our temperatures for Monday and Tuesday highs are going to be around at the mid 90s as well. For tonight, 68 degrees, your overnight low temperature, mostly clear skies. Winds are going to stay calm for us tonight, not expecting any rain. Could see a little bit of patchy fog develop around rivers, any bodies of water, uh, creeks that you're around. But overall, I don't think the fog threat's going to be too bad either tonight, though, either. 71 degrees by 7 o'clock. By noon, we are in the lower 90s, mostly sunny and dry. And then by 5 o'clock, we're going to keep it mostly sunny and dry as well. 94 the temperature by 5 o'clock. And again, I think Sunday is going to be the hottest day. I'll show you what that temperature is looking like. And also, when you can expect that best chance for any rain coming up, all those details, I'll have those in your seven-day forecast. Donald Trump back in D.C. trying to rally Republicans around him. I'm Matt Gelka in Washington with more on what they talked about coming up. In politics tonight, former President Donald Trump returns to Washington for meetings with Republicans in Congress. Well, Fox 17 News Matt Gelka shows us how lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are reacting to Mr. Trump's visit. And by the way, you can let us know what you think by scanning the QR code that will appear here shortly on your screen during this story. I'm with them a thousand percent. There was me a thousand percent. We agree just about on everything. And if there isn't, we work it out. Donald Trump is trying to rally the Republican Party around him, meeting with members of Congress on Capitol Hill for the first time since leaving office January 6th and since becoming a convicted felon. Well, you talk about the core issues that are defining this election. You know, uh, inflation, 20% uh, inflation over the last three and a half years. Uh, a border with uh, criminals coming in. Trump is rocking it just like he's going to rock the election. Deep infighting has fractured Republicans on Capitol Hill over policy disputes. Trump reportedly tried to get the GOP aligned on the issue of abortion. Some Republicans have pushed for a nationwide policy, while others believe the issue has cost them at the polls. The president's uh, statement has been what it's been this entire time. This is an issue that states are going to make decisions on. While Trump planted the seeds on the Hill, his allies have been crafting Project 2025, a roadmap from the Heritage Foundation for huge changes if Trump wins a second term. The proposal includes firing thousands of government workers and appointing conservatives, dismantling the Department of Education and overhauling agencies like the FBI and DOJ. They were unbelievable patriots. Joe Biden's campaign dropped an ad Thursday tying Trump to the January 6th riots ahead of his visit. As Democrats say, a second term for the former president would be nothing short of authoritarian. I don't know why we just don't take Donald Trump at his word. He's um, said that he's going to uh, use dictatorial powers on day one. He has shown uh, a cavalierness about democracy. He's shown an endorsement for violence. House Democrats launched a task force this week to counter Project 2025, calling the conservative plans a coup. Reporting in Washington, I'm Matt Galka. 
Now, during that story, we had a QR code up linking you to a poll asking which party you want to see in control of Congress next year. 862 votes are in and an overwhelming uh, number of these respondents, more than 81 percent, say they want to see the Republican Party in charge. Our thanks for all who cast a ballot. Still to come tonight, a key battle in the abortion rights fight reaches the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, new tonight, the abortion pill, Mepifistone, will stay on the market following a major Supreme Court decision this morning. The justices ruled against doctors who sued the FDA over its new regulations for the drug. It's a major win for President Biden's reproductive rights agenda. But as Fox News correspondent Rebecca Castor reports, both pro-life and pro-choice advocates say the fight is not over. We'll be back. We are not giving up hope. The pro-life generation does not stop. In a significant setback for pro-life advocates, the Supreme Court ruled Thursday that the abortion pill Mifepristone will stay widely available. It's not surprising, but it is disappointing. The pill is legal in 37 states. But a group of concerned citizens and doctors sued the FDA after it fast-tracked new regulations for the drug, which include allowing patients to buy the pill through the mail without a doctor's visit and extending the window it can be taken from 7 to 10 weeks of pregnancy. The court did not address those concerns, simply ruling unanimously the plaintiffs did not have the legal standing to sue. What would have to happen is that you got a plaintiff who actually suffered an, in an injury um, from Mifeprestone who could come back and say, you know, if it hadn't been for the FDA making this available without going through all the safety protocols, my injury would never have happened. In a statement, President Biden said in part the fight for reproductive freedoms continues and indicated women's rights are at stake if Donald Trump is reelected. However, the former president has previously said he would not push for a federal abortion ban. We are not yet out of the woods. This shouldn't be a decision women are forced to fear year after year, case after case. There's one more abortion case before the Supreme Court dealing with whether federal law can force doctors to perform emergency abortions, even if state law prevents it. That ruling is expected by the end of the month. Outside the Supreme Court, Rebecca Castor, Fox News. Continuing coverage now on former President Donald Trump's felony convictions in New York. As Fox 17 News' Christine Frizzell shows us, some GOP lawmakers in Congress continue to discuss their concerns about that trial. It's a case House Republicans say never should have happened. Their response? A House hearing examining the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which they and their witnesses argue did not have the authority to bring a case of election interference to be heard in a state court. The FEC had looked into and later dropped the case. District Attorney Alvin Bragg's decision to pursue charges against former President Trump for alleged violations of federal campaign finance laws marks a significant deviation from this established legal framework. Despite the former president being found guilty by a jury on all 34 charges against him, Attorney Elizabeth Price Foley argued he was denied due process because he did not receive timely notice of the alleged crime he intended to commit, comparing his prosecution to Russian nesting dolls. What is that other crime that Mr. Trump intended to commit? Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan saying the case's quote star witness was a proven liar. Michael Cohen's lied to Congress, he's lied to the FBI, and he's lied to court. It's not often you can lie to all three branches of government and yet become the star witness in a prosecution of a former president. Still, most of Michael Cohen's statements were backed up with documents and other witness testimony. The selected jury members agreed to by both parties. They decided 34 times that Donald Trump falsified documents to cover up his 2016 criminal election interference scheme. Democrats insisting the misdemeanor charges were right to be upgraded to felonies because they violated state and federal campaign finance laws. Donald Trump was making hush money payments to a porn star to hide their affair from voters. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, along with prosecutor Matthew Coangelo, will also testify before the committee in just about a month after Donald Trump receives his sentence. Bragg says they will appear voluntarily and that he's looking forward to setting the record straight. In Washington, 
I'm Christine Frizzau. Well, our average high temperature this time of year is 87 degrees. We were able to hit 94 today, and I think we're going to do it again tomorrow. Going with a forecast high temperature of 94 degrees right here in Nashville tomorrow. Average high 87, so we're going to be well above normal again for tomorrow. And yesterday, or, uh, today we hit 94, so that now makes four days so far this year that we've seen 90 degrees or higher again from January 1st to today, June 13th. And we're going to see a long stretch of 90 degree or higher days now as we head through the rest so this week on into next week as well. Temperatures, I think the lowest that we get is 92 on Saturday. Humidity values aren't going to be terrible as we head on into the start of the weekend. 99 on Sunday, humidity will start to bump up a little bit. That'll be the warmest day that we see. And then Monday and Tuesday, we're down to the mid 90s. And then Wednesday, we're back where uh, we keep it in the mid 90s. And we should keep it in the mid 90s for Thursday as well. So we have several days in a row of these 90 degree temperatures or higher, which is well above normal. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think we are pretty much all all dry can't entirely rule out just a very stray shower on Sunday and Tuesday, but I think the best rain chance is going to come into play on Monday and even then that's only a 20% chance for a couple of isolated showers and maybe a couple of thunderstorms. This is now looking at the following week, June 21st through 27th. The Climate Prediction Center giving us just a little bit better than normal chance for above average rainfall amounts and then for that same time frame, we're looking at warmer, a better chance for warmer than normal temperatures across all of Tennessee and Kentucky. There's no preparation really I mean, no, that no, you no. can do for a standardized well, he, test like this. You either know the material or you don't, and, and it depends on how you test. In tonight's crisis in the classroom, the scores for the TCAP third grade language tests are in for Tennessee. The state says the scores remain steady across the volunteer state. Now, part of the TCAP is used to determine whether third graders will be allowed to be promoted to the fourth grade. Fox 17 News' Peyton Muse explains how it works and why some are critical of the state's scoring formula. If third grader scores do not meet or exceed expectations for the English language arts portion of TCAP, they're at risk of repeating third grade. The state lays out opportunities to get students reading levels up again. They can go to summer school, get tutoring, or retake the ELA portion of the test. J.C. Bowman with Professional Educators of Tennessee says the retention numbers can impact schools and teachers. Some districts may need more resources, but Bowman wants to make this clear. If a student does not pass the test, it doesn't mean they can't read. It means they need help before going forward. If you can read on grade level by end of grade three, then it means that you can go on to be successful and really great read on, read on grade level moving forward. But a lot of the times, these kids have already built their social network. They've made their friends, they've learned social skills, and it's really hard and embarrassing for them to be held back. Most experts will tell you, let's retain them earlier, like kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, rather than by third and fourth grade. This is another aspect of the law he believes needs to be considered. The state says the final numbers as far as how many third graders will have to repeat third grade, that's not gonna be ready until later this summer. We will continue to push for those answers from the state. Reporting at the Capitol, Peyton News, Fox 17 News, your code red station. Well, this week on Full Measure, allegations of mistakes made by the news media when it comes to political coverage. Full Measure, Cheryl Atkinson takes a look in this preview of Sunday's show. Looking at the record, there were an unprecedented number of errors made by national news organizations against Donald Trump. One example, in 2017, BBC, The Guardian and others wrongly assumed that Trump was faking listening to a speech in Italian since he wasn't wearing translation headphones but Trump was wearing a translation earpiece. Now that Biden has been president for three years, the record shows the media aren't making as many mistakes. And when they do, they usually benefit Biden or are against Trump. Well, this week on Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson, an investigation of news media mistakes, as we just mentioned, of the past two American presidencies and the implications for 2024. That's Sunday morning at 7.30 and Sunday night at 11, right here on Fox 17. Today was a warm one and it's more the same as we head through the next several days. Sunday is going to be our hottest day. I'll let you know. 
In tonight's Spotlight on America, the dollars and cents cost of an open border in Arizona. Now, it remains a key issue in the presidential race, border security, that is. Fox 17 News' Christine Frizzau giving us a view from one of the busiest border crossings in the country. It's a scene that's been playing out right here on this land okay. for more than 100 years. John Ladd runs this 16,000 acre ranch he took over from his father, who took it over from his. This is the worst it's been for us. We're not giving up, but what do you do? He's referring to the change in human traffic on his land. Most people escorted into the country by smugglers. The cartel strictly controls who comes across the border. I can't keep my fences up. Um, yeah, I just do the perimeter, and it's easier to cut the fence than to crawl through it. So uh, that's, that's an everyday deal. His is one thread in a patchwork of stories that spans across the entire state of Arizona, which has seen a significant rise in border encounters over the last year. We have seen everything from public safety challenges, uh, national security challenges, and humanitarian challenges. Sheriff Mark Daniels confirmed the criminal organizations make it nearly impossible to secure and patrol the border. Along the border, when it comes to intelligence, the eyes and ears, who's doing a better job, border patrol or the cartels? Well, the cartels. You look at their profits. You look at their, their end game. They are. From the ranch land of Cochise County to Arizona's small towns and larger cities, the challenges are there, but a bit different. It would have either come in uh, on foot, some came in by Uber, some came by taxi, some came by border patrol, and some came by ambulance. Yuma, Arizona has also experienced several waves of large groups of migrants, some in dire need of medical attention. Yuma Regional Medical Center, the only hospital of its size within a nearly 200 mile radius, equidistant to Phoenix and San Diego. A significant influx of individuals seeking emergency care, and who were pregnant who had had little to no prenatal care. Scheduled inductions would sometimes have to wait just because we had several emergencies happening with migrants at the same time. Dr. Robert Trenchell says at the time, billing Medicaid was not an option, which meant $26 million in medical bills. How much of that have you gotten reimbursed? Zero dollars. Zero dollars for that $26 million in charges. The drain on hospitals, schools, and local governments is adding up as those who profit from the crisis, the cartels get richer. For Spotlight on America, I'm Christine Frizzau. All right, we're cranking up the temperatures just like you said would happen. We these sure next are. Few days. Right on time. Right on time, and it is happening. We were at 94 today. This was the fourth 90 degree or higher day that we've had. So but not incredibly humid. I mean, somewhat, but not hard. You're absolutely right. You know, I think these next few days are kind of going to be similar too. Not incredibly humid, not near as bad as we could be for this time of year. By the time we hit Monday and Tuesday next week, though, we will start to see a little bit more moisture work in, and uh, that is going to make things feel a little bit more humid. Temperatures will still be in the mid 90s, so it is still going to be warm. At once we get beyond this week and weekend and then the next week too. So just summertime in the south, 83 degrees right here in Nashville, mostly clear skies. We're going to stay clear as we head through the rest of the night too. Also, we're going to keep it dry, not expecting any rain chance really uh, across Middle Tennessee or Southern Kentucky. One thing we are watching though is this cold front and you can see those pink boxes that have been popping up right there on that radar map. Those are severe thunderstorm watches that have been in effect for parts of Missouri on into Illinois, Indiana too. That cold front is going to keep on on sliding down to the south a little bit, but I think that whole system is just going to run out of steam by the time it reaches us. We have that high pressure in place that's helping keep us clear and dry. It's also keeping us warm too. Temperatures right now they're in the 70s for most areas. 73 Cookville, same goes for McMinnville, Lebanon at 73, 78 up in Gallatin, 80 in Clarksville, and Columbia coming in at 76, 78 down there in Lewisburg. There's that cold front I was just showing you on the radar map. It'll keep on trying to drop south, but notice just all that rain disappears with that cold front, the closer to us that it gets. And again, it's just going to run out of steam. The only exception is maybe just a couple of light showers, very isolated that we get for later in the day tomorrow. But I think most areas will stay dry through tomorrow, not expecting a great rain chance at all with that little system moving through. The one thing it will do is drop humidity down just a little bit for tomorrow and the high temperature. I think we're going to have high temperatures held to the lower 90s or that's uh, for Saturday behind that cold front. 
Tomorrow is going to be another warm one. Saturday, 5 p.m. still dry. Sunday, I think we started out dry. Later in the day on Sunday, we could get a few isolated showers that try to build in here in the middle Tennessee and southern Kentucky. Not expecting a great rain chance, though, on Saturday. Just can't roll out a few showers or Sunday. And then on Monday, I think we'll see the best rain chance, but even then, it's only about a 20% chance for just a few isolated showers and thunderstorms. That'll come later on in the afternoon when we start to heat up a little bit better, too. Going into Tuesday, this is Tuesday morning, 7 o'clock. We're off to a dry start Tuesday, and I think most of Tuesday, we keep it pretty dry, too. We could see a few of those showers along the Mississippi River, but I think most of that is going to stay south and west of here. Humidity values for the next few days, like we were just talking about, not really all that bad for this time of year. Monday and Tuesday, though, it does start to get more humid to carry us on over into early next week. 68 degrees, our low temperature tonight, mostly clear skies. Winds are going to be calm for us tonight. Tomorrow, waking up, heading out, lower 70s by 7, lower 90s by noon, and then by 5 o'clock, we should be in the mid 90s. Plenty of sunshine again for us tomorrow. It's really going to be a pretty good day, just a little bit warm, but again, the humidity is not going to be terrible. Friday, Bonnaroo forecast. This is the forecast for Manchester, lower 90s. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're going to be in the mid 90s. That's going to be the hottest day area wide. 99 are high here in Nashville on Sunday, mid 90s on Monday, a 20% chance for a few isolated showers and storms. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the heat does not go anywhere. We'll keep high temperatures into the mid 90s. Well, speaking of that heat that's just ramping up this week, earlier in our newscast, we sent out this poll asking just how hot is too hot, right? There's a, a spectrum here. Uh, just over 300 people have weighed in, and most people, 52.5%, say anything over 90 degrees. That's where they draw the line. 20% saying anything above 80, and also there's no such thing, so they're almost tied there. <laughs> And 8% uh, said anything above 70 degrees. So there you have it. Thanks to everyone that voted. Just ahead on Fox 17 News at 9, fired, now indicted. What this former Metro Police officer. In Operation Crime and Justice, a former Metro Police officer arrested for taking part in an adult video while on duty. Metro Police say 33-year-old Sean Herman took part in a mock traffic stop in an OnlyFans skit where they say he groped the exposed breast of the female driver. Metro says they determined the video was made while Herman was working as an officer in the Madison precinct. Herman is charged with felony official misconduct and was fired from his job. Well, Father's Day is this weekend, and we were just wondering how you plan to celebrate the dads in your life. Our question to you on our X poll, what are you getting, Dad, for Father's Day? 143 people uh, have weighed in, and uh, we put a variety of potential uh, you know, gifts up there. Cash, gift card, 20% said, yeah, that's what we're doing. 14.7% uh, said that we're going to make or buy a meal. 8.4% said going to buy Dad some clothes. And... Uh, 56.6% .6 of people say we're going to do something else. I'm dying to know what that is. If you'd like to uh, join the poll, it's still active right now. You can cast your vote by scanning the QR code that will appear uh, there on the right-hand side of your screen. Use your smartphone camera. It'll link you to our poll, and we'll update the results again tonight on Fox 17 News at 10. Up next, Disney fans feeling the financial pinch, the double-dip price rise that's costing folks that visit Disney World. And up past their bedtime, the In the economy tonight, the story on rising prices at the most magical place on Earth. Studies show that food prices at Disney World are up by an average of 61% over the last decade. That is nearly twice the rate of inflation. Popular treats like those Mickey Mouse-shaped ice cream bars you may have seen at the park, 63% higher over that span. The cost of tickets to Disney World have spiked by an average of 56% over that same 10-year period. Several NFL stars and a very familiar Fox 17 personality getting together tonight for a round of golf. Fox 17 morning news anchor Erica Glover joined the Tennessee Titans player Eddie George and a host of other all pro NFL legends for the 15th annual NFL alumni charity golf classic. It took place at Hermitage Golf Course and from what we can tell it appears everyone had a good old time out there. This is Fox 17 News at 10, your code red station. From my calculation, they had me at 900 and 906,000 gallons of usage. From my meter calculation, I've only used 90,000. 
New tonight, a Laverne family battling the city after being overcharged for water every month for more than two years. It adds up to several thousand dollars. Now for the record, the city admits the error. They made a mistake, but as Fox 17 News Caitlin Miller shows us, it's how to make this situation right that these two sides can't agree on. Most people pay less than $100 for their water bill, but we spoke with the Starnes family who say that they're paying about $400 per month for their water bill. They say that they took this up with the city, but are unhappy with the proposed resolution. Robert Starnes showing us his water meter, pointing out how many gallons of water his family has used since they moved into their home two and a half years ago. It doesn't match up with the city's records, showing where Starnes has been billed for using hundreds of thousands of gallons of water in that same time frame. Fox 17 News reached out to the city of Laverne. It did admit there was a system error on the Starnes account. The city spokesperson says it tried to make things right by offering the family a $4,000 credit. But Starn says that isn't good enough. The water bill is so high, I'm fighting water bill, light bill, car note, mortgage. Starnes wants a check from the city. The city says reimbursement checks are only issued if a resident is moving and claims the family used a voucher assistance program to pay the bill and would only be eligible for half the overpayment refund. Again, the meter shows that they use just over 91,000 gallons of water. Now the city did admit that it was a system error and now they have to come to an agreement as to how they'll get reimbursed. Reporting from Laverne, I'm Caitlin Miller, Fox 17 News, your Code Red Station. Not been good at intervening effectively. Not Operation Crime and Justice, two teenagers killed by other kids all in a matter of weeks. The youth crime crisis prompting some in the community to call for changes when it comes to tackling the problem. Two weeks ago, the Bellevue community rocked after a 13 year old boy was shot and killed at a popular park. And then again last night at a Madison Park, a 16 year old also shot and killed both killed by other teenagers. Violence and family dynamics a lot of times get passed down from one generation to another generation. And it's not that people don't love their children or want the best for their children, but we're creatures of habit. We tend to repeat what we know. That was Valerie Craig with Tennessee Voices for Victims, and she used to work with incarcerated youth, and she said she noticed commonalities in families surrounding domestic violence and child abuse, along with abandonment issues. She says that we have to be more intentional about treating childhood trauma. An update now on the leaking of the Covenant school shooters writings tonight. A Metro judge has rejected a request by the Tennessee Star, an online news site in town to cancel a hearing that is set for Monday about the latest leak. Chancellor Aisha Miles is asking the Star newspaper to show why it should not be held in contempt. An attorney for the Star says that Tennessee has a shield law that keeps courts from pressuring news outlets like it to reveal its sources. Tennessee Star says it will appeal Judge Miles order. The Star is among the groups who filed suit to force Metro Police to make the shooters journals public. Now in Operation Crime and Justice, a former Metro Nashville police officer facing felony charges after allegedly appearing in an adult video on OnlyFans while on duty. Metro Police arresting 33 year old Sean Herman at his Sumner County home following an investigation that he took part in a mock traffic stop on the site where Metro Police say that he inappropriately touched a female driver. Investigations show the video was made back on April 26th when Herman was on duty with the Madison Precinct. He worked at the department for three years. In your community tonight, a local nonprofit opens a new facility to help address Nashville's housing crisis, which is ever growing. Dream Streets now has 48 new apartments for people who don't have homes while they wait for something more permanent. The nonprofit says it's not a house. They understand that, but it's safe and a drug free environment that will keep residents from becoming homeless. This new oasis, if you will, also offers wraparound services, including groceries, a social worker and mental health counseling. Housing is not a problem, it's a crisis, and we work with a lot of families that we call uh, pre-homeless. They're individuals who have jobs, they have um, families, a lot of them are caregivers for other people, and they're caught in a vastly growing city with nowhere to go. 
Now it just opened, but all 48 of the units are filled and there is a waiting list for future openings. In your entertainment news, Bonnaroo 2024 underway at a farm near Manchester and attendees are in for a long hot weekend. Music fans from across the country are streaming through the festival gates. They're dressed for the weather, which will be in the 90s while they're here. The big acts include Post Malone, Diplo and Megan the Stallion, Megan the Stallion. Everyone that we spoke with, though, talked about being attracted by the vibe at Bonnaroo and the freedom to be who you are. Come here, you can see all walks of life, doctors, lawyers, teachers, people walking around in glitter, costumes, just to, just to get away from themselves. So this allows you, there's no judgment here, so you can see some of the most craziest costumes, and I think that's the best part of it. The festival runs through Sunday, and we'll talk to more Bonnaroo fans and detail the festival's VIP experience on Fox 17 News later on. And it is going to be a warm Bonnaroo this year. Like you heard, it, temperatures in the 90s. I'll show you what day looks the warmest for Bonnaroo this year. Right now here in Nashville, we're still holding on to some warmth, too, from earlier. We hit 94 degrees earlier this afternoon, the fourth time we've hit 90 so far this year. 82, that's our current temperature right here in Nashville. A little bit of a crowd out there, too, uh, for tonight overall. A pretty good night, too, if you have any late night plans for whatever reason. This cold front that is up here northwest of here and moving in parts of Missouri, Illinois, on into Indiana now, too, that's going to keep on dropping to the south and it'll try to bring us a rain chance for tomorrow, but I really think most all of that is going to just fizzle out before it even gets here. So the rain chance tomorrow, very, very slim. Most all areas are going to stay dry tomorrow. Temperatures right now low to mid 70s. Most spots 73 Cookville, also in McMinnville, 78 up in Gallatin. We're at 75 in Dixon. Same goes for Columbia, 78 the current temperature in Lewisburg. Air quality alerts in effect again for tomorrow. That's going to be for every one of these counties highlighted in orange. That's going to include spots like Gallatin, Nashville, Nashville, Murfreesboro, Columbia, Dixon, all included in that air quality alert. So if you have any sort of respiratory issues and a little bit more sensitive to that, just kind of uh, limit your time outside of for tomorrow. Temperatures tomorrow are going to be warm again. We're going to be in the 90s for the next several days. Sunday is going to be the hottest day for us. And then I'll show you if we have any sort of rain chance coming up in the future to help out with any of that heat. All those details in just a bit. Thinian protests are still taking place on some college campuses and beyond. Fox 17 News Kayla Gaskins has a look at protesters causing concerns in New York City. Pro-Palestinian demonstrators filling a subway car in New York City, making it clear not everyone was welcome. Raise your hand if you're a Zionist. This is your chance to get out. Okay, no Zionists, we're good. While many found the scene concerning, Aaron Tarr with the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression says it appears to be protected speech. Just based on the one short video clip I watched, I don't think there's enough there to prove that any of the protesters were making a true threat. The First Amendment is intended to give maximum breathing space for political speech and debate in this country. What is not constitutionally protected protest is what happened in Brooklyn, where demonstrators vandalized the home of the Jewish director of the Brooklyn Museum, throwing red paint and hanging a sign calling her a white supremacist Zionist. NYC Mayor Eric Adams sharing the images on social media, writing, this is not peaceful protest or free speech. This is a crime and it's overt, unacceptable anti-Semitism. Also in New York this week, protesters went to the memorial on Wall Street for the hundreds who died at the Nova Music Festival on October 7th. The Nova Music Festival! The Zionists decided to rave! The White House calling the memorial demonstration horrifying. Law enforcement analyst John Miller telling CNN these demonstrations have evolved and escalated as outside groups get more involved as fears of serious violence grow. That's part of the concern of NYPD intelligence people, which is as the vitriol reaches this higher pitch, um, vandalism, anti-Semitism, will somebody cross that line? Amid these concerns, eight people with suspected ties to ISIS were arrested in just the past few days in New York City, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting. <laughs> Looking ahead, demolition of the Parkland, Florida High School, where a gunman killed 17 people six years ago, will begin tomorrow. That work was supposed to begin today, but heavy rains in Florida pushed things back. Students never returned to that building after the shooting. It was actually used as evidence in the gunman's murder trial. Demolition, we're told, will be finished before the school district resumes classes in the fall. 
I'm Angela Brown in Washington, D.C. Your kids may be spending a lot of time on their phones, on the Internet, but what is that doing to their brain? New research may hold the In your health news tonight, too much time scrolling the Internet on phones could lead to serious health concerns for teenagers. Fox 17 News' Angela Brown tonight to show us the impact extended screen time has on your teen's brain. Here's the study grabbing attention published in Plo's Mental Health. Researchers reviewed 12 neuroimaging studies involving 237 10 to 19 year olds diagnosed with internet addiction. They found brain signaling related to controlling behaviors, attention, and understanding their own emotions was disrupted, meaning too much internet could hurt their brain. Can you reverse that? Um, you can reverse it. It takes longer to reverse than it does to do. Max Chang, the study's lead author, described the impact on young people saying, for example, they may struggle to maintain relationships and social activities, lie about online activity, and experience irregular eating and disrupted sleep. Betsy Linnell, assistant professor of psychology at Cedarville University, says parents need to act now. Everybody's addicted to their phone, but when you think that 75% percent of the people that are addicted to their phone also say that they don't do well in relationships. 70 percent also have other addictions. It is alarming that we have to help kids not be addicted. Reports indicate all of the studies reviewed by the researchers were conducted in Asia and that most of the participants were actually males. China was the first country to declare internet addiction as a public health crisis. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. In health news, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says at least two people in the U.S. have contracted what they are calling a new dual mutant strain of the flu. The agency reports this new H1N1 virus, or actually viruses, are resistant to the main flu antiviral that many hospitals use. Lab tests find that this uh, dual mutant uh, virus group uh, we're up to 16 times less vulnerable to antiviral medication. Harder to kill it. Now, despite this, a CDC spokesperson says the flu shots that are out there can still offer some protection. The two cases that have been detected so far are in Connecticut and Michigan. Well, Father's Day is this weekend, and we're wondering how you plan to celebrate the dads in your life. So earlier tonight, we sent out this poll asking, what are you going to get your dad for Father's Day? 150 people weighing in. Most people, 57.3% uh, say none of these choices here, but 8% said clothing, 15.3% said a meal, maybe take them to a meal, cook a nice meal, and 19.3% said cash or gift cards. Each night, look for a brand new poll on our X page that you can participate in. Well, today was just the first of many 90 degree or higher days that we're looking at. This is going to be a long stretch of those. I mean, we are in June after all, though, here in Tennessee. So just kind of to be expected this time of year. But the good news, though, the humidity is not as bad as it could be for this time of year. I'll show you that here in just a minute, too. Radar not really showing much activity at all here across Middle Tennessee or Southern Kentucky. It is still pretty dry for us right now. One thing that we will be watching, though, is this cold front. Right now we have those severe thunderstorm watches that are still in effect for parts of Missouri on into Illinois uh, as well well that cold front is going to keep on moving our way taking a severe threat to those areas but by the time it reaches us that severe threat is going to be long over with and really all that rain too is just going to fizzle on out not expecting really any rain chance at all uh, for most of us at least here tomorrow across middle tennessee or southern kentucky current temperatures there in the 70s for most areas uh, again we're leading the pack right here in nashville with temperatures still remaining in the lower 80s here's that cold front that i was just talking about once this cold front starts to work its way down closer towards Kentucky, I think a lot of that rain is just going to uh, fizzle out. Not going to have to really deal with much of a rain chance at all. The only exception to that will be just a few of these very spotty, light, isolated showers that try to make their way down in the parts of Middle Tennessee. But overall, I think most all of us are going to stay dry here for tomorrow. Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, we're off to a dry start. We're going to stay dry through the rest of Saturday. Not going to have to worry about any rain chance on Saturday. Sunday morning, another dry start. We could see just a couple of isolated showers pop up later on Sunday afternoon. That chance is going to stay pretty low, though. 
though. I think we'll call it mostly dry for Sunday. As we head on into Monday morning, Monday morning we started out dry a little bit later on in the day, though. Things change up just a little bit, and I think that's going to be our best rain chance here in Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky. We have about a 20 to 30 percent chance for a few isolated showers and storms later on in the day, later in the afternoon, earlier in the evening on Monday. Tuesday morning, we're off to a dry start, and then we stayed pretty much dry through the rest of Tuesday as well. Most of the rain is going to stay a little bit to the west and south of here. Humidity values today weren't really too bad, even though we had a high temperature at 94. It didn't feel near as bad as it could feel this time of year. They're going to stay somewhat reasonable for the next few days. Monday, Tuesday, they bump up a little bit uh, higher uh, into that next category, and temperatures, high temperatures, are going to remain in the mid-90s early next week, too. So we are going to be starting early next week out warm as well. 68 degrees, our low temperature for tonight, mostly clear skies. For tomorrow, lower 70s. By noon, we'll be in the lower 90s, and then by 5 o'clock, we should be in the mid-90s. Mostly sunny, dry, and hot tomorrow. 94, our high temperature here in Nashville. 92 on Saturday, upper 90s on Sunday. That's going to be the hottest day of them all. Monday, we bring in that 20% chance or so for a few isolated showers or storms during the afternoon and early evening hours. 96, the high on Monday. 94 on Tuesday. And Wednesday and Thursday, looking dry now, too. High temperatures should remain in the mid-90s with mostly sunny skies. Weather Window, presented by the National Weather Desk. This whirlwind, or dust devil, developed over a hayfield in western North Carolina. They often form on warm, sunny days, but are rare in that part of the country. They typically last just a few minutes, with wind speeds well below most tornadoes. And it's that time of year in Maine. Sunset here on Bailey's Island was at nearly 8.30 last night. The sun rose again before 5 a.m. this morning. And you can see more weather stories like this every weekday morning on the National Weather Desk. It starts at 8 a.m., not on Fox 17, but on our sister station, MyTV30. I'm Jeff Harrison, Washington. Chronic absenteeism is becoming a major problem across the entire nation, but not all parents agree. We explain why they say there are more pressing issues coming up. Nearly 22 million children living in America rely on schools for their meals. Fox 17 News and our parent company, Sinclair Broadcasting, are part Tonight in Crisis in the Classroom, the battle over how to best address chronic absenteeism. Fox 17 News' Jeff Harris talks to a parent to find out how they handle kids missing school. That mom says she agrees chronic absenteeism is a problem, but she says there are other problems some parents may be even more focused on, like bullying, gun violence, and even teacher salaries. A mom of three living in Arizona, Tina Presume tells me she has no issue with her kids missing a day of school every now and then. I would give my kids an allowance to, to stay home at least once every three months. But she says some kids now are using the pandemic to justify missing a lot more than just a few days. There was an excuse, you know, the pandemic. We don't have to go to school now. And so I think that's been used as an excuse. An assistant professor at George Washington University, Adriana Glenn tells us chronic absenteeism is defined as missing 10% or more of any academic school year. So if you think about you know, your average school year, somewhere around 184 days, you're looking at about 18 days of missed school. Now, Glenn tells us they do see chronic absenteeism more in certain grades than others. She says students in pre-K, kindergarten, and also first grade are absent a good amount. Then between fourth and ninth grade, that absenteeism starts to go down a little bit. But once students reach high school, those 11th and 12th grade years, it starts to climb back up. Those are trends that we see across the nation. But Presume says chronic absenteeism is only one of the problems parents are focused on. Bullying, gun violence, and finding teachers are also major issues. It's tough to be a teacher. The kid, there's 30 humans, right, that are so judgmental, staring at you all day long. Like, that will break you down at some point. We're hearing a lot these days about your microbiomes in your gut. I'm Liz Bonus. What are those? And what do we need to eat to feel better? It is just ahead. The average American is expected to spend nearly $200 on dad this Father's Day. We're going to break down some of those spending trends that's coming up Friday on Fox 17 News this morning.
In your health news tonight, we've all heard the saying, you are what you eat, and turns out there may be some truth to that. As Fox 17 medical reporter Liz Bonus shows us tonight, your gut health is very closely connected to your overall health. Hey there, hello to you. Your gut breaks down the foods you eat and absorbs critical nutrients into your body. If you don't get those nutrients, it can impact everything from your microbiomes, as they're called, to your energy levels. Hi, Carrie. How are you doing today? Carrie Boss knows what that feels like. It was to the point where I, was, I need to be very serious about my health because I am just tired of feeling terrible all the time. After lab tests showed she had candida, or a fungal infection related to yeast, she reached out to registered dietitian nutritionist Preeti Bansal Kursagar, a specialist in functional medicine at Ohio's Integrative Nutrition and Healing. The gut is the engine of our body. If the engine is not working fine, how's the gut going to run? So Preeti, who previously shared this cooking demonstration with us, says you have to give the gut engine what it needs to work against all the health conditions that are gut related. If the gut is not working fine, I'm going to have headaches and I'm going to have inflammation and joint pain and all those things just because my gut is not fine. So first step, food allergy testing to find out what's aggravating Carrie's gut. So we remove the aggravators. Second step is healing the gut. So we are looking at the gut microbiome and we do some testing to see where the microbiome imbalances are and then we balance it. Microbiomes are the bacteria, good and bad, that live in your gut. To change them, you have to change what you eat. It kind of opened the door to a bunch of other foods that I had never been exposed to. Quinoa, I did not grow up with quinoa. I didn't really eat brown rice. I did not eat wild rice. Um, lentils, I did not eat many beans. For Carrie, that meant adding a lot more fresh foods and fewer processed foods, less caffeine and less sugar. Within months, Carrie told me when it came to her symptoms. I feel excellent. I always had congestion. I had brain fog because my whole head was congested all the time. Preeti just walked me through every single one and we just eliminated every single one. Kind of gives new meaning, doesn't it, to the expression, you need to listen to your gut? With your health news, I'm Liz Bonus reporting. And it's going to be a warm one. That's really the only story that we have for the next several days. Uh, I'll show you the seven-day forecast coming up. If you have any outdoor plans, just take it easy out there. Again, it's going to be hot. 92, our high temperature on Saturday.